this is an awesome effective education breakout. I'm so excited that we have Stephanie Gray with us today. Do you guys know who Stephanie Gray is? She's an international speaker. She has an awesome book and organization, both called Love Unleashes Life, because what you guys do, right, by loving on people unleashes life. She's spoken to Google. Man, she's spoken to huge audiences internationally, and she has trained them to be effective with reaching their peers with this pro-life message. So I am so excited to welcome to the stage Stephanie Gray. Thank you. It is great to be here. I hear there's a storm coming. Did you hear that? There's, what was that? It's in the Midwest. That's right. Well, we're from all over, and i got to go back west to Canada, but not yet. So to begin, I wanted to begin with a little thought experiment. Now, I see that there are some people walking in. If you can walk with high speed, because this thought experiment that is going to require you to close your eyes is not going to be done well if you're walking. So if you can take your seats. And so I'm going to do a little thought experiment to begin with. And here, I'm going to have to ask that you just trust me, OK? So when I ask that you close your eyes, please keep your eyes closed until I tell you to open them. Now, you're going to hear music. You're going to hear me talking. Don't open those eyes until I tell you. So if everyone could please trust me and close their eyes right now. And while your eyes are closed, if the music could please begin. Oh, I love to sing. Barney is a dinosaur from our imagination. <laughs> when he's told he's what we call a dinosaur sensation. D did you say sensation? <laughs> Barney's friends are so big wow. and small. They come from lots of while places. While the music comes to a stop, we could keep our eyes closed. I want you to imagine that you are subjected to that music day in and day out. I want you to imagine that you are not enjoying listening to that music, but I want you to imagine that you can't tell the people who have put you in front of the TV set through which that music plays because you can't speak. And I'm I want you to imagine that you cannot flail your arms to tell people to stop the music through physical gestures because you can't move. And I want you to imagine that you are sitting in front of a TV set with that music repeatedly playing and you're in a wheelchair that has a strap holding you up across your chest. And I want you to imagine that as that music is playing, that strap begins to dig into you. And it's starting to hurt you. But you can't tell anyone that that's happening because, again, you cannot speak and you cannot move. I want you to imagine that the episode ends and it's time for a shower. And again, because you cannot speak and you cannot move, someone comes and they shower you and the water is cold. And then I want you to imagine that your caregiver splashes soap in your eyes and it stings. But again, you can't tell them that hurts. I want you to imagine after your shower, it's lunchtime, and a big hot mug of steaming hot tea is brought to your mouth, and you gulp it down even though it's scalding because it's the only liquid that you'll get for hours. You feel stuck in a dark world, and no one knows how much you're suffering. Please open your eyes. What I had you imagine is not made up. It is the lived experience of a boy by the name of Martin Pistorius. If we could have my first picture up, please. I think I'm going to control it here. There we go. When Martin was 12 years old, he was an average little boy growing up having fun in South Africa. But when he was 12, he started to get sick. And he got so sick that all he could do was sleep. Sleep almost 24 hours a day. 
and he started to stop being able to talk. So that within a year, Martin was non-communicative. His limbs stopped working, his muscles wasted away, his hands and feet began to curl in. Every day he was sent to a care home. At night he was sent back home to his family. He was sent to a care home throughout the day and he was subjected to the types of things I had you imagine and worse. There were times in Martin's suffering where some of the care workers would most brutally, physically, and sexually assault him. And he could not cry out. For the first three years of Martin's illness, he actually became unaware and has no memory or recollection of what happened. But when he was about 16 years old, he began to wake up. But he became a mind trapped in a body for almost 10 years. For almost 10 years. He could hear everything. He could comprehend everything. But he could say nothing. How do we know that this happened to Martin? We know this because of an amazing person by the name of Verna. Verna was someone who worked at one of the care homes, and she would go to the patients and give them aromatherapy massages. And Verna was different from so many others because Verna, when she interacted with Martin, really saw him, really noticed him. She would look into his eyes, and even though he couldn't communicate back, she treated him as though he was her equal, as though he was someone to be reverenced. She talked to him as though he comprehended. And one day, Verna happened to be watching a program on TV about stroke patients who could no longer speak and how computerized technology was developed to help the nonverbal stroke patients communicate with other people. Verna came to work the next day and was telling Martin all about this. And it was as though she looked at him and said to him, Martin, you're aware inside, aren't you? Martin, I bet if you did those computer tests, you would be able to communicate, wouldn't you? And all he could do was sit there, head tilted, eyes blinking, limbs curled. He wanted to scream, but he couldn't. But here's the point. Verna had eyes to see that which others couldn't. So many people saw Martin, I'll have another photo here, just like that, or like that. A body of a growing teenager and a young adult, but the mind of a six-month-old child. But Verna knew that he did not have the mind of a six-month-old child. She believed that he understood. And so not only did she have the eyes to see, but she knew that with the eyes to see what others couldn't, she had the responsibility to cast the vision so others could begin to see as she did. And so she went to his parents and she said, I am convinced your son is aware inside. I am convinced that you need to take him for testing. I do not think that he has the mind of a six-month-old child. I think he understands everything. Please take him for this testing program I just learned about. And his parents did. And Martin began to be able to communicate. And since then, he has regained the use of his upper body. He has been able to drive a car using only his hands. He's a wheelchair racer. He's written his autobiography, which I highly recommend, called Ghost Boy. He is a web designer, a developer. He has a university degree. He has given a TED Talk. But his greatest accomplishment is that he moved from South Africa to Great Britain, where he got married. And recently, just a few months ago, he and his wife had a baby boy. And I think my clicker's not working. Bridges just advance ahead to the black slide. The technology in the background could do that. Well, we'll leave Martin up. <laughs> the reason why I wanted to begin with the story of Martin is because I believe if we think about the preborn child, that child is much like Martin, how Martin was, entirely dependent on someone else, unable to communicate, and therefore, unfortunately, the preborn child like Martin was is all too often disregarded by too many.
But just as Verna came along and knew that the eyes were the windows to the soul and that she could really see through what was before her into the heart of who was in front of her, we too are gathered here because we believe and know that the preborn child is alive and is worthy of respect and worthy of protection. And because we have the eyes to see that, we have the responsibility to cast the vision the way Verna did, to become an advocate for preborn children the way Verna was an advocate for Martin. And so what I want to do today is talk about how we can do that effectively, how we can communicate with people so convincingly that they catch the vision we have that the preborn child is alive and well in the womb. How do we do that? Well, one way I think we need to do that is provide a window to the womb. And one way I want to do that is to show you some amazing imagery of preborn children that has not yet been seen by most people. And hopefully my clicker works here, trying to advance. If we could have the 10 the week preborn child. There we go. So this is what's so amazing about this. This is not a computer generated image. How this image was obtained is a tiny video camera was inserted in the uterus called a fetoscopy for the case of the fetus or early in pregnancy, an embryoscopy camera. And when that little tiny camera was inserted, it was so small it couldn't capture video footage of the whole child at once. But it could zoom into the heart, it could zoom into the head, it could zoom into the feet. And then what happened was each of those zoom ins were freeze framed, so this actual depiction of what the preborn child looks like in utero, alive, is seen in this photo, and we'll advance to the next one at nine weeks, in the next one at eight weeks, and the final one at seven weeks. So many people are unaware of who the preborn child is, and so these images allow us to open their eyes to the things unseen, to see what we see and what we know. But inevitably, if we do this, abortion supporters will come along and say, okay, you know what, maybe in the first trimester, the last half of it, abortion isn't okay, because those images are pretty cool, 10, 9, 8, 7 weeks. But what about the first half of the first trimester? What about before 7 weeks? What about 6 weeks, 5 weeks? three weeks, the moment of fertilization where you have one cell. You're not going to be able to present an incredible image like this when it comes to the one-celled embryo. So maybe abortion is justified in the first few weeks of pregnancy. So how do we respond? Well, what I want to do is equip you to be able to respond to that objection and many other objections. But it's important that when we respond to objections, we know the types of tools we should use. And there are two tools in particular I think we should use when responding to objections from abortion supporters. The first tool that we want to do, use is to ask good questions. And the second tool we want to use to respond to abortion supporters' objections is to tell good stories. We want to ask good questions and tell good stories. When you ask someone a question, what happens? They begin thinking, right? The silence descends upon the room. Is anyone going to respond to me? So when you ask someone a question, they begin thinking. And so we ultimately want to change how people behave, but in order to change how they behave, we need to change how they think. And so asking someone a question enables, them to enables us to influence how they think, which will influence how they behave. But not only when we want to change someone's behavior do we need to change how they think, but we also need to change how they feel. So let me ask you this. Have you ever watched a movie or read a story or novel in which you were moved to tears? Anyone? or in which you laughed really hard. Yeah, those are the emotions being impacted by stories. Movies, novels, these are just ways to represent stories. And so if we want to change how people behave, then we need to ask questions that changes how they think and tell stories that changes how they feel in order to achieve the goal of changing how they behave when it comes to being faced with an unplanned pregnancy or interacting with someone who may be faced with an unplanned pregnancy. So going back then to the images that I had shown where the abortion supporter might respond, well, before those amazing images could be presented, when the child is just one cell, then abortion is okay. 
So bearing in mind the power of questions and the power of stories, I want to equip you for how we can respond that abortion is not okay even when the preborn child does not look like the amazing images that I showed, when the preborn child is just one cell. And the way we can ask questions and tell stories in response to that objection from abortion supporters is something that I did when I was at a campus in Canada debating a philosophy professor several years ago. And the event that we were doing together had a packed room of about 200 students. And just before the event began, a group of protesters marched in. And these protesters were holding massive signs that said, my body, my choice, and keep your rosaries off my ovaries, and, and all of these different slogans. And so I saw them march in, and I thought, oh, I hope they don't disrupt. I'm fine if they're here. In fact, I want them to hear what I say, but I hope they don't disrupt. Well, thankfully, when they marched in with their big signs, they did not make, a, you know, a verbal raucous. And so they took their seats and the debate began. And so in my opening remarks, I wanted to convince my audience that the one-celled embryo is human like you or me and equal to you or me. And I decided to draw on questions and stories to do that. And so I asked the students if they had ever um, used a Polaroid camera before. And some people had been to weddings where people had them on the reception tables where you could take photos. And so various students raised their hands that yes, they used Polaroid cameras. And, and I just made sure the whole audience knew how it worked by going through it by saying, okay, well, you know, for those of you who haven't used it, you know, the camera is kind of boxy and it has a stack of cards and you put the cards in the box and you snap a photo and when the card comes out, I ask the students a question. I said, when the card comes out, what do you see initially? And someone said, black marks. And I said, okay, then what do you do? And several audience members immediately put their hands up in the air and did this. I said, right, you shake it. And then I said, in a few moments, what you saw as black marks on the card in front of you, very quickly you see as what you had just seen before you in the proper shape and so forth. So I said to the students, I want you to imagine this. And then I launched into a story. And I said to the students, I want you to imagine that you go on vacation and you plan to take trips of your holiday using a Polaroid camera. And I want you to imagine that you go on vacation to where I know there's a group, I think in this room from, there's a group from Scotland. Are they here in the room today? There they are at the back, really loud. That's right, the Scots are fierce. Don't argue or debate with a Scot. I am a Scot, so don't debate with me, right? Okay, so anyways, my dad's from Scotland. He's got a very thick accent. Louise, one of the people in the group over there, says that her dad's accent and her accent are the same. Apparently, mine's not quite as good. But anyways, imagine I said to all of these students that you go on vacation to Scotland and you take pictures of your holiday using a Polaroid camera. And I said, imagine that you go to a place in Scotland that's quite well known called Loch Ness, where some people say there's a monster in the, in the lake. And so I said to the students, imagine that while you're touring around Loch Ness, you pull out your Polaroid camera and take all kinds of photos. And then I said to the students, now imagine that at one point as you're taking photos, you see not too far from you the Loch Ness Monster. The humps and bumps, the curves, they're sticking out of the water. So you excitedly point your camera in that direction and snap a photo when the card comes out. Now I said to the students, imagine that just as you captured that picture, the Loch Ness Monster went underwater. Telling this story, I asked the students a question. I said, would you be disappointed the monsters disappeared? And someone said, well, yes. And I said, okay, well, what would console you in your frustration? The monster's gone. And someone else said, well, you've got the picture. And I said, right. Now, remember, I said to the students, that as students, you've got student debt. And that's really overwhelming to you. And so you're excited to have this picture because you're thinking, this is not for my photo album. You're thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell this to newspapers and magazines and make a whole lot of money. So you're super excited about the money you're going to make off this picture. And so I said to the students, imagine you begin excitedly shaking the little card. And as you're doing that, someone else who's nearby, who had just also caught a glimpse of the Loch Ness monster, monster, excitedly grabs the card from you to have a look at the picture. But all they see are those black marks, and they think the photo didn't properly take. And so with disappointment, the person rips it and throws the pieces of paper on the ground. I said to them, would you be upset that they ripped up your photo? And the students all said, yes, of course we would. And I said, Okay, well, imagine you respond in your anger and say, how dare you destroy this picture? And the person responds to you and says, it was just black marks. Why do you care so much about black marks? 
I said to the students, you would likely reply, it wasn't just black marks. Everything about the image of the Loch Ness Monster was captured in an instant. It just needed time to develop. And at that moment, all those protesters who had entered the room maybe 15 minutes before leapt out of their seats and began chanting, my body, my choice, my body, my choice, for 40 minutes until security came along, made them leave, and the debate continued. But their reaction, I think, demonstrates the power of a story. It convicted their hearts. It made the point abundantly clear that just as the image is captured in an instant but needs time to develop, who each one of us is in our uniqueness and distinct from our parents is captured in the instant of fertilization, the instant of sperm egg fusion, when we're just a one-celled embryo, but like the Polaroid picture, we simply need time to develop. Another objection that we sometimes hear is people will say, well, the preborn child might be genetically human, but isn't a person, and that's why abortion is justified. So remembering questions get people to think which is necessary as a precursor to change their behavior, the question we can ask the person is this, no pun intended to person, what is a person? If you think the embryo is a human but not a person, how would you define a person? And inevitably, the abortion supporter will say something like, well, a person is what is different from an animal. You know, a person is someone who is thinking, someone who's rational, someone who's conscious or self-aware, and the embryo, even if human, at fertilization, isn't rational, conscious, or self-aware, is therefore not a person, and abortion is justified. So we can simply ask another question. Why isn't the one-celled embryo rational, or conscious, or self-aware? Why can't that one-celled embryo think? And the answer is because the one-celled embryo doesn't have a brain. Well, why doesn't the one-celled embryo have a brain? Well, because the one-celled embryo hasn't developed a brain. Well, why hasn't the one-celled embryo developed a brain? Asking yet another question. And the one-celled embryo hasn't developed a brain because the one-celled embryo hasn't had time. And time is reflected in our age. And so a question we want to ask abortion supporters is this. Should our personhood be grounded in what we are or in how old we are? Should our personhood be grounded in what we are as members of the human family or in how old we are? So then a question I often like to ask people is this. Do you believe in human rights? And I can tell you if you ask someone that question, they will typically respond, of course I believe in human rights. And then you could say, okay, well, who gets human rights? And then they might look at you like, well, it's, isn't it obvious? And of course it is obvious, but the power of questions is that the person who communicates the answer begins to own the concept. And so we don't want to force stuff in, we want to draw stuff out. And so you ask them, well, who gets human rights? They'll say, well, obviously humans. And you can say, yes, exactly, kind of like if we believe in children's rights, what group do you need to fit in to get the rights? Children. If you believe in women's rights, what group do you need to fit in to get the rights? Women. So if you believe in human rights, the group you need to fit in to get the rights is human. And so as long as preborn children of human parents are human, which we know scientifically they'd have to be if that's what their parents are, then it follows that if we believe in human rights, since they fit into the category of human, they ought to have the basic right to life. The next point I like to make to people is that the United Nations has even acknowledged that personhood should be grounded in what you are, not how old you are. Because in their universal declaration of human rights, in the preamble, it refers to all members of the human family. And then, as the document goes on, in Article 6, it says everyone has a right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Well, who's everyone? Well, in the preamble, that's all members of the human family. So they're essentially communicating if you're a member of the human family, you ought to be considered a person. So since preborn children of a human mother and father are human beings as well, then according to the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, by being a member of the human family, they ought to be considered a person. Now, the next objection abortion supporters often come up with is they'll say, well, even if 
technically the embryo is a human because the parents are, and even if I believe in human rights, then it would follow they get human rights, that what makes the preborn different from the born is that the preborn child is so totally dependent on the mother and her body that that's why abortion is justified. So then I would just ask another question. I would say, well, let's take a newborn child. If you leave a newborn child alone in a room for several days and come back a few days later, are you going to find a living newborn child or a corpse? Likely a corpse or a child that is very close to death. So clearly a born child is entirely dependent on someone for her survival. And we wouldn't consider it acceptable to neglect or directly dismember the born child. So why would we say in the case of the preborn child who's so totally dependent on others that it would be okay to dismember, kill, harm in some way the preborn child? And the abortion supporter will often say, well, look, if you don't want a child and you're tempted to leave a child who's born in a room, there are many other people who would take the child from you. So instead of abandoning the child in a room, you just place the child in someone else's arms. But embryos and fetuses are different. You see, newborn children can be placed in the arms of any of us. But if someone is in a crisis pregnancy and no longer wants the embryo or fetus in their body, they can't just detach the child and give it to you and place it in your womb or that of a friend. And so because only the mom can care for the child, your analogy, O oh, pro-lifer, the abortion supporter will say, breaks down and that's why abortion is justified and infanticide is not. And so the question we need to ask is this. The fact that only the pregnant woman can care for the preborn child, unlike any number of individuals who could care for a born child, does that make the mother less responsible for the preborn child or more responsible for the preborn child? You ask the question and then you tell a story. And the story I'll sometimes tell is this I'll say, imagine this. I'll say, imagine that you are skilled in the Heimlich maneuver, which apparently is a new name, uh, the abdominal thrust, if we have any first aid people in the crowd. So imagine you are skilled in this abdominal thrust so that if someone is choking, you can swoop in and come to the rescue. And so you're well trained in this procedure. And imagine you're at a restaurant with friends and you're eating a lovely meal and it's very obvious that there's a group of paramedics also enjoying a meal at this restaurant and they're having a lunch meeting. And let's imagine someone in the restaurant begins choking. Now, you are well-trained and certified in how to respond, but so are all those paramedics. And in fact, a couple of the paramedics jump up, swoop over, help the person who's choking, and saves their life. You have remained at your table with your friend. Have you done anything wrong by not intervening? No, because you knew not only that there were other people around to help, but that they were actually helping. So then I would say to the abortion supporter, let's change the story. Let's imagine, instead of being at a restaurant, that you were at your home eating with just your friend and no one else is around, and you are well-trained and certified in how to do the, the um, Heimlich maneuver to help someone if they're choking. And so as you're eating with your friend and talking with your friend, your friend begins to choke. And your friend is, is so totally choking, you realize, I need to do the Heimlich maneuver, I need to do this abdominal thrust, and you don't. And your friend dies because no one else is around to help. Have you done something wrong now by not intervening? Absolutely. So then you ask a question having told the story. What is the difference between those two scenarios? In the first situation, many other people could help and were helping. It lessened your responsibility. But in the second scenario, only you could help and it actually heightened your responsibility. And so we can say to abortion supporters, you're right. When a woman is pregnant, she can't just detach her child and place it in the womb of someone else. She is the only person who can keep that child alive. But if we think of the choking scenario, that doesn't lessen her responsibility. It heightens her responsibility. Another objection abortion supporters will come up with is one I heard from an audience member in Florida a few years ago. He came to the microphone and said, my stepmom had an abortion because she was told her uh, baby was going to die at birth. Was she wrong? And so my first response was one of sympathy. And I said, I am so sorry for the, the difficult situation that your stepmom found herself in. I don't pretend to know the suffering she must have faced, the anguish that must have caused her. I said, your question is fair, and I promise I will answer it. 
But I said, I think I can best answer your question by asking you some questions. Are you okay engaging me in a dialogue in front of the audience? And he was okay with that. So then I said, remembering the power of questions and stories, I said to him, imagine this. Imagine that you have a loved one, we were in Florida, who lives the opposite end of the country, maybe California, and they, they call you up and they say, I've just been diagnosed with cancer and been given four weeks left to live. Now that's a super short story that I ended with a question. I said, would you wait until the third week and the sixth day to hop on a plane and go say goodbye to this person you love? Or would you take the next plane out and savor every moment of every day of the next four weeks with this person that you love and care deeply for? And he said, well, the second scenario. I said, me too. Here's what I think this says about us. I think what it says is that when we have a minimal amount of time left with someone we love, we want to maximize the minimal time that we have. We don't want to cut short the already short time in front of us. Now that we understand the principle from the story, I said, let's apply it to the scenario you asked me about, what your stepmom faced. When she was told maybe halfway through her pregnancy that her baby was going to die at birth, and that's why she chose an abortion, before being told her baby was going to die at birth, she probably thought she had maybe 50 or 60 years with her child. But at the moment that news was given, she went down from having 50 or 60 years to only 20 weeks, the remaining portion of the pregnancy. I said, why would we cut short the already short time she has left? When we want to maximize the minimal time, say no to the abortion, carry through with the pregnancy and savor every moment of every day of the next 20 weeks with the child that she loves. Now some people might say, yes, but when the child dies at birth, it's going to be sad. Okay, but remember, that was a wanted pregnancy, so if she has an abortion, she's still going to be sad. And when the, the first Christmas comes along and the baby's no longer there, she's going to be sad. And when the first birthday or what should have been the first birthday comes along, she's going to be sad. Whether she has the abortion or carries to term and the baby dies naturally, she's going to be sad. She's going to remember and she's going to grieve. So abortion does not take the memories and the sadness and the grief away. What abortion does, it takes away the gift of time. And when we love people, we maximize our time with them. On other occasions, I have debated people who make an argument not simply that the preborn child is disabled and going to die at birth, but they make the argument that the ch preborn child doesn't have a right to the mom's body. On another campus, a student came up to the microphone and said, you know, on our campus they always have these blood drives. You know, they appeal to us college students to donate our blood to help the sick. And she said, you know, I do that. That's a nice thing to do. I think, I, I think I'm happy to do that. But I'm always asked if I would like to do it. No one kidnaps me and forces me to become a blood donor and extracts blood from me. And they wouldn't be allowed to do that because it's my body. Well, in the same way, the fetus doesn't have a right to essentially kidnap the pregnant woman and make use of her uterus the way someone would try to kidnap one of us and make use of our blood. Just as the blood is in my body and therefore is my body and I have a right to it and shouldn't be forced to give part of my body away, in the same way my uterus is in my body, it's my body and the fetus or embryo doesn't have a right to use it the way you don't have a right to use my blood. If I want to share my uterus, fine, but you can't force it from me. If I want to share my blood, fine, but you can't force it from me. So then I asked her a question. I said, well, think about the purpose of your blood. What is it for? It circulates through your body to keep your organs healthy, to keep you alive, to keep you functioning. I said, let me ask you another question. What does your uterus do every single month? Every single month, the uterus grows this lining and gets really thick for what purpose? In expectation that another body will come in, the preborn child, and will try to implant. I said, your uterus every single month by its nature is showing itself to exist more for your offspring's body than for your body. 
And so therefore, although I don't have a right to claim access to your blood, the preborn child does have a right to claim access to your uterus because the uterus by its nature exists more for the child than for you. What questions can we ask? What stories can we tell to help people see that which they don't yet see? We have the eyes to see who the child is. We have the eyes to see the pro-life response. But as only Verna did with Martin and how she needed to cast the vision and convict the parents and become an advocate for him for further testing, we need to cast the vision and help people see what we see, to know what we know through the power of stories and the power of questions. One more example that I want to give you when it comes to just making the intellectual case against abortion is when we hear the objection, if a woman is going to die, then abortion is justified. And I often say, I agree with you that that's a problem if the woman's going to die. I agree with you that that's a crisis that we want to intervene on in an ethical way. And then I'll say, let me ask you this and then I'll tell a story. I'll say, imagine my sister has heart problems and needs a heart transplant. Now imagine, because I love my sister very much, I decide that I'm going to do everything possible to save my sister's life. And because she's so far down on the wait list for a heart, I can't wait. And so I kidnap a stranger, and I'm well connected, let's say, to an underworld of black market doctors. And so I get this stranger that I've kidnapped into this place where there's these black market doctors that perform open heart surgery and then just remove the heart from this stranger, and then they transplant it into my sister, and my sister no longer dies. Now I'll say to the person I'm dialoguing with, if I celebrate the end result that I have saved my sister's life, does that justify the means that I chose to get there? Does it make it okay that I killed a stranger in order to achieve the end? And they say, of course not. And I say, correct. I think what that little story reveals is no matter how good the end result is, the path to get there can never be evil or can never be morally wrong. And so in the same way, when a woman's life is in danger, the end result of saving her life is a good. But the means to save her life can never be directly and intentionally killing the preborn child. Because that would be doing wrong to bring about a good, the way kidnapping and killing a stranger would be doing wrong to supposedly bring about, well, to bring about the good of saving my sister's life. Now, just because I say you can't do an abortion to save the mother's life, it doesn't mean you can't save her life. It's kind of like imagine you're driving home and there's a big orange detour sign up. It says road closed ahead. And then there's all these signs telling you a different path to take. You still get to the end result of your house, but you don't take your usual path. You go another way. And so you can still save the mother's life, but I'm just saying don't take the path of killing the child. Take another path. Treat both lives equally. Respect both individuals and do your best to save both lives. Now there's more details that we can go into for what some specific cases are when a woman's life is in danger that time does not permit me to share right now. During Q&A, if you want, I can. My book also addresses that, which you can get at my website, loveunleasheslife.com. But the principle remains that we may not do an evil, kill an innocent person, to achieve a good, save another person's life, but we can find another path to achieve that good end. Having shared all that I have, I think it's very important that as we take on the role that Verna did, as she was an advocate for Martin, as she reverenced his life, as she really saw him, as we take that role on and reverence preborn children and really see them and help others see them and become their advocates. It's very important that we also remember to reverence and respect the person in front of us and see them as much as we reverence and respect the preborn child as we see them. In my work, I have met so many college students who have told me great stories of profound pain that they have personally lived through. I remember one student told me that he was so poor he grew up only eating food as a result of food stamps. I know another student who told me that she'd gone to a party, she felt sick, and so she fell asleep on the couch, and she woke up being raped. 
I met another student who'd been bounced in and out of the foster care system, and the night before that I met the student, one of her only close relatives had committed suicide. I met another student who told me that his parents were both crystal meth addicts and he'd been brutally abused throughout his childhood. As pro-lifers, we need to remember that it's important to have strong minds, but also tender hearts. And that if we interact with people that seem a little rough around the edges, a little annoying even, who are communicating messages that aren't logical and aren't seeming to receive the logic that we're communicating through our questions and stories, it's often because they're coming from a place of pain. And we need to see them like we see the preborn child. I'll never forget once being asked about rape. And I gave my, my classic answer that although rape is indeed a terrible injustice, it's not fair to give the death penalty to the innocent child. And the student was unconvinced by my answer, so I went into a little more detail, and I talked about how we don't kill born children whose fathers have committed crimes, even if they're reminders. So we shouldn't kill pre-born children whose fathers commit crimes, even though they're reminders of what had happened. She was unconvinced, until when we were dialoguing one-on-one, -on -one, I started to talk about people I knew who had been victims of sexual assault. And then she opened up and shared with me that she had been raped ten years prior. And my inability to get through to her was made clear because she was coming from a place of pain and had built up a wall. And so I set aside all my logic and my arguments and my stories to just listen to her story and ask how she was doing. And I want to stress how important it is that you do the same. What I want to do now is play for you a short video of an exchange that happened on a college campus. And I'm playing this video as an example of what not to do. Because although the pro-lifer is speaking to the young woman in the center of the film, although the pro-lifer pro speaking to her saw the pre-born child and wanted to advocate for the pre-born child, they didn't see the girl in front of them. Let's have a look. If we could have volume. If we could start again and have volume, that would be great. Thank you. If it's possible to play the other video, that's totally fine with the non-blur, if we can have audio. Okay, so I'll just say to the tech people, thank you, but I will just be able to tell the story verbally, so, so thank you um, uh, for making that attempt. So here's what happened. There was a girl on a college campus, she's debating back and forth with a guy, she had revealed to him that she had been raped. And then she talked about, you know, he, all he was focusing on was you, you, you have to look past the difficulty, you have to put, look past the suffering, and, and, and you know, think about that, the fact that there was a baby. And her response was, well, I was a baby. And you know what he came back with? A technicality. He caught her on a technicality. He said, you were 13. We could just stop the video. Thank you. If we have no sound, we don't need the video. Oh, oh, we do. OK. For some reason, it looks better to you. This reason being it doesn't, God. It doesn't look better at first. You have to look past the pain. You have to look past the suffering. You have to look past the Right, so I had years of suffering to look forward to if I had made that other choice. So you're, I had the rest of my life suffering. You're looking at suffering all by itself. And you're looking, yeah, and suffering again, does that to you. And looking, and when again, you have a lot of suffering, it's not like it stays on the side. It's usually right in front of your face. It is, and it's hard. But you're always looking at yourself in this, this situation. You have not thought once about that baby and how... I was get a, chance a baby at that age. You were 13. That's not a baby. Sorry, I was a teenager. Does that make you feel better? No, it doesn't. Would it, would it be better if I was five when it happened? So I could, I could tell you that I was more baby. You wouldn't have gotten pregnant. <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten pregnant if I was
Okay. I mean, the point is, you guys are getting off on all kinds of different tangents. The bottom line is, it's not right to kill. Regardless of any of the It's not killing. It's a surgical procedure to remove cells. Well, it's alive when you start. It's dead when you stop. Then what is it? It's not alive on its own. It's alive in my body. So? It can't live without me. So, therefore, it's up to me to make that choice. Well, it's an individual human being. It's an individual. It's not an individual human being because it doesn't Wait have its own Who's lungs, DNA brain. Does it, have? it has a combination. No, no, no. It has its own individual DNA. It's not your DNA. <laughs> if it were your DNA, then it would be your body. But it has combinations of the mother Right, so you're saying it's different than yours, right? I don't really give a rat's ass about but the DNA. But that's the whole crux of the issue. No, the crux See, of the everybody's issue saying, is, it, uh, is that there are is reasons it a choice? people make choices. Choice There's a to reason do what you people make choices. And you're saying that the reason they have is just complete crap. That there's never a reason to do this. And I'm telling you, I am a living example of why abortions should be legal. Of why abortions should be available to any woman who needs them. So she can live her life. Well, those are all wonderful okay. points, but it's still wrong to kill. Who says it's wrong? Oh, I do. And? And what most is? of these other people. Right, and I bet you those people in this camp would agree right. with me. Right, but see, they don't understand. See, they're saying that it's a it's a woman's choice to do what she wants to do with her own body. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. But an unborn fetus is not your body. It has different DNA than you. See, if it were your body, every person body. has it's DNA. It's living in my womb, right? right? Just listen is it to renting me. out a room? Listen to my one thing. Every person has DNA in their body, and DNA is identical from cell to cell. I was taught that in biology class here. Fantastic. So, if it's your body, it'll have your DNA. If it's somebody else's body, it'll have different DNA. That's a biological fact. Why do you care so much about DNA? Because that's the Why do you care so much about DNA? If we can have the video stop, please. There is lots of things you tech and one of them is when life <laughs> Why do you care? So right. much about DNA. What was she really uh, saying? But not verbalizing. See, I don't care. I don't care when. I don't care when it was. Care about me. You see, they didn't see her. They didn't have the eyes Verna had. They disregarded her. The way people disregarded Martin, slapping soap in his eyes, cold water on his skin, hot coffee down his throat. They didn't see her. And so, going forth today, my hope and prayer is that you'd leave here with the conviction to see with new eyes, to see with the eyes of Verna, who looked at him in his weakness, vulnerability, suffering, and pain, and said, you're in there, Martin, aren't you? and make every interaction with those who do not share your view a type of expression to them that you know that they're in there, that you see their value, you see their worth, and the angrier they are, you're wondering what their pain is, and you're willing to sit in their story. And to be able to see the preborn child with the eyes so few do not see them with. To acknowledge that they're weak and they're dependent, they're vulnerable, and they can't defend themselves. So we need to stand up and defend them. But with a profound wisdom and charity that knows how to have a strong mind and a very tender heart so as to win an argument as well as the person in front of us. Martin, in one of his radio interviews, said, I think being seen and having another person validate your existence is incredibly important. And how true that is, that his life was transformed from isolation and suffering to profound flourishing because he was seen. My hope and prayer is that you leave here today seeing the preborn child as well as the boy. Thank you very much. Thank you. We may, thank you. We may have time for a super quick question or two if I can bite the clock. So if someone wants to come to the microphone, uh, I'm happy to take a 30 second or less question and happy to give a response. The microphone is right here.
Stephanie, great. I wanted to elaborate on your comment regarding uh, the Heimlich maneuver when the only person possessed it and in the other scenario where they didn't, and is the burden, is the obligation greater or less? And I think you were right about that, but it needs to be said that when you compare the situation to a woman carrying a child, her obligation is greater than just about anyone else except maybe its father because she's its mother. Absolutely. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a great additional point. So two things. Whenever we make an analogy, the analogy also has similarities along with differences. And so there are differences. You're right. It's not parallel as stranger or a friend to that of a mother and child. But the similarity is another person's vulnerability heightens my responsibility. But I think an additional point we can make, which you very well address, is to ask the question, uh, what do civil societies expect of parents? You know, it's nice to feed someone who's starving, but if you don't, you won't go to jail. But um, if you don't feed your child in your home who's starving, you will go to jail because we expect parents have a responsibility to meet the basic needs of their children. So just as feeding a born child is a basic parental responsibility, uh, allowing the child to grow in the womb made for the child is a basic parental responsibility. So that's a great additional point. Thank you. I'm now in the minus 23, so I will let the next person take over, whoever that is. Thank you.